This recording has been released into the public domain by the Bonson Institute, where we aim to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Well, let's get started. How many of you have had a course in philosophy excluding elementary logic? How many of you have had a course in philosophy at some time in your life? Ah, not bad, not bad. Now, how many of you think you understand philosophy now? Oh, much fewer. <laughs> this is unusual. It's a very sad commentary on the state of education in our country, and I think also on the ability of the Christian church to encounter the real challenges, ideological, theological, and ethical of our age, because we as Christians have not come to understand what philosophy is and what philosophers do and how we can be better philosophers ourselves. But then a lot of us aren't motivated to do that either. I'm afraid that those who teach philosophy have not done a real good job of, one, showing why philosophy is important, or really making much of an effort to make it understandable to people. Now, maybe I will fail in those aims as well. I hope not. I pray that God will enable me to explain things to you so you can kind of catch on to what's happening and get more enthusiastically involved in philosophy. But it's important, I think, for us as believers to do that. If you look at Colossians, the second chapter, in the third verse, I'll give you a chance to find that if you have your Bibles. Colossians, the second chapter, in the third verse, you will see that Paul tells us that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. Philosophy, the word philosophy, comes from two Greek words. It simply means the love of wisdom. Okay, philosophy deals with the foundations of knowledge, what we know about uh, reality, and how we should live our lives. And those who know these things, how we know, what we know, what it is that's most real, what the nature of reality is, and how we should live our lives, are wise people, or so it is thought. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Now, Paul tells us that in Christ are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul believes that those who are Christians are the only ones who are able to do philosophy, really. The only ones who have a good reason to do it, who can do it successfully. And yet very few Christians even care about philosophy. They've been turned off to philosophy. And as he told you in the introduction, I'm one of those weird birds that has a PhD in philosophy. I obviously don't have the same view of the situation, and I have a real burden, I believe for to explain to God's people what it is that philosophers do so that you might realize, first and foremost, that everyone does philosophy. Not everyone does it well. Though. And the reason why we study philosophy is so that we can sharpen the tools of philosophical reasoning that God has given each and every one of us and that each and every one of us use. Now, you perhaps have come tonight thinking, well, yes, perhaps I do philosophy a little bit, but I know that my neighbor doesn't because, I mean, he just lives for the weekend. He just lives to party. He just lives to have a few beers and to watch the game. And he says, we only go around once in life. You've got to grab for all the gusto you can get, and that's the end of it for him. So he's no philosopher. But you see, when your neighbor says, we only go around once in life, and therefore, grab for all the gusto you can get, he has expressed a philosophy, hasn't he? Maybe not a good one, maybe not a well-thought-out one, not a well-articulated one, but it is a philosophy nonetheless. It says, live day because there is no tomorrow. Now, you must know an awful lot to say that there is no tomorrow. You must know something about the nature of reality and the course of history. You must know something about the nature of man and his place in the cosmos the grand scheme of things, or if there is a grand scheme of things. You must know something about how we should live, and even if there is no tomorrow, how we can best attain happiness today. And so there you have your neighbor that you thought was just some kind of anti-intellectual bump on the log, and he's a philosopher. Now, if that low life is a philosopher, <laughs> certainly we are all philosophers too. 
right? Those of us who take maybe five more minutes to think about uh, the nature of reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. Everyone does philosophy. Okay, so those of you who are taking notes or who are hoping to get course credit someday for going through these tapes with your finger on the rewind, I hear the joke about Bonson here. Those of you who are hoping to get credit for this course, you want to make sure this gets down in your notes first of all. Everyone does philosophy. Not everyone does it well. But that poses, of course, the question, what is it that we're doing when we do philosophy? Can you see that back there? Is that writing big enough? What is philosophy? I've maintained that everyone is a philosopher. We all do philosophy, not necessarily well, but we all do it. And so we better find out what we're doing when we do philosophy. And this is kind of an embarrassment to many philosophers because you'll often have people, like in the university setting, who will say, why should I be a philosophy major? What can you do with philosophy? Can you make more money? No. Uh, is it important for peace? Maybe, but probably not. What good is philosophy? Now, I know what people who study medicine do. And I know what people who study architecture do. And I know what people who study math do. And I know what engineers do. And I even know what the guys who specialize in physical education do. What do philosophers do? Do you produce something that's valuable? No. Do you write really exciting pieces of literature for people to read when it snowed in and it's a boring, cold night? No. In fact, most people get to hate philosophy, unless, of course, you're an insomniac and you need some way to fall asleep. Then you pick up being in nothingness by itself and you start reading. And it won't take you long. What does it philosophers do? If I said everyone does philosophy, and yet we don't understand what philosophy is, none of us would be inclined to study it or to pursue it further, whether I know what I'm talking about tonight as well. So I'm going to try to explain to you what philosophy is by first going two steps back. And I'll give you a little insight here. Put this in your margin. The reason why most people don't understand philosophy and get disinterested in it is because they don't realize at what level of abstraction philosophers work. And since we are not prepared for that level of abstraction, we come in and our funny bone is not tickled, and we are not interested, we don't see any practical, immediate benefit to it, and it's hard, and we give up. We say, so what? I mean, those of you who raised your hands a few minutes ago and said you're taking a philosophy course, I'll bet you that if you didn't like the course, that instructor, he lost you within the first couple of weeks. You went in this, what are you talking about? Why did they do this sort of thing? What is this all? And if you're going to do it well, you really have to sit around and be willing to do nothing but think. And that's not something we encourage in our culture. I mean that seriously. To do philosophy, you must be able to reflect. You must be able to sit down and just think through an issue. From A to B to C to all the consequences that follow. So... To understand where the philosopher comes into the intellectual game, I'm going to take two steps back and try to explain to you what philosophy isn't, and then get to where philosophy is. In Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26, we learn something about the nature and the task of man. For God created man that he might have dominion over all the works of his hand. God created man so that he might be able to subdue the created order to the glory of God. And one of the ways in which God has equipped man to do that is he's made man a curious being or a curious animal. The only reason men have the gumption to go look into the created order and to set it in order and to master it and to use it is because they are curious. Why are things like this? What could I do to make things better or to organize and so forth? God has given to all of us who are of normal intelligence curiosity. 
And that curiosity leads us to want to gain control over our environment. And by gaining control over our environment, by gaining control over the world in which we live, by the way, that world includes our emotions, our feelings, our expressions of art, and so forth, by gaining control over our environment, we see that knowledge is power. Not necessarily big-time superstar, international, cosmic power, but knowledge in one way or another is power. If you know how to drive a nail, you are further down the line in controlling your environment and doing things than your next door neighbor who can't drive a nail. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is the ability to do things. Even when talking about very abstruse and complicated and intellectual acts, who know the most are able to do the most. Okay, so curiosity has been given to us as part of the image of God, really, that's in us, that sets us on the task of learning about the world, gaining knowledge, so that we can control our environment to the glory of God. So the first step in the intellectual journey of mankind and of any individual is the step of curiosity. But of course, curiosity, we say, killed the cat. Curiosity by itself doesn't accomplish a whole lot. What are you curious about? You're probably curious as to why the price of gas goes up sometimes and then goes down sometimes. Probably curious about what happens in the personal life of some rock star. You're curious as to what causes some disease or how you can get relief from a headache. You're curious about a lot of different things. And if you just let your mind go wild and just be curious, you'll not get anywhere at all. Mankind and individuals need going to be successful in the intellectual endeavor. They need to get beyond just simple curiosity, the disorganized going from one question to another, to the level of intellectual attainment that we call science. The difference between the educated and the uneducated person, to put it very broadly, is that one is not scientifically oriented and the other is. When you get an education, you learn to discipline your curiosity. Science is a disciplined inquiry that is systematic in its approach to some delineated aspect of human experience and tries to find general laws to explain and predict behavior or events in that area. Let me say that again, then I'll explain it. Science is a systematic approach to some delineated aspect of human experience aiming to find general laws by which we explain and predict behavior and events. When someone's curiosity goes beyond the level of mere curiosity to the level of science, they are going to get systematic in what they are studying. They're going to try to organize things, and they're going to try to see how things work, and they're going to try to be able to explain them. Now, this system, however, doesn't attempt to take everything into account. Science studies some delineated aspect of human experience. And that's why we have biology, and astronomy, and chemistry, and agriculture, and on and on and on. These various sciences systematically try to understand the area of human experience. Not experience as a whole, or even the preconditions of having experience, but just the experience of growing crops, or the experience of studying the stars, or the chemical breakdown of things, what have you. Okay, so the systematic approach to a delineated aspect of human experience, with the aim especially of finding general laws. General laws that account for how things happen. Help us to explain how things happen. Where does malaria come from? There are certain general laws, you see, of biology and disease and so forth, that help us understand where malaria comes from, and also helps us to predict, in this case, usually not how to get malaria, but how to avoid getting malaria, or helps us to predict how to ease the symptoms of malaria. You see, in scientists, when they write books, and other people read those books so they can become doctors and help malaria victims. What they are reading about are general laws. They are not just reading case histories. Just one 
unidentified or, if you will, isolated incident after another. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Eventually, in our curiosity, we try to systematically bring together what we know and account for what we know in terms of generalizations or laws that show the regularities of our experience, if there are regularities to find. So our curiosity, when we get more intellectual, more disciplined in our inquiry of the world, leads to science. And that's about where most people in their education leave things. But you know, we can ask some questions about science too, can't we? We can ask questions about the nature of science. What is it that is this delineated aspect of reality that's being studied? How do we know what we know? What is law-like behavior? What do we mean by a regularity? What kind of system are we using? How do we know that our tools are active, that our memory is reliable? We can not only ask questions about the nature of science, whatever science it may be, from agriculture to auto mechanics, we not only can ask about the nature of science, we can also ask about the extent of science. If people who did this sort of thing did it completely, if we were to have written down all of the general laws that could be known about anything in human experience, Here's an interesting question. Would we have written down everything there is to know? No matter how you answer that question, yes or no, I think the answer is obviously no. We would not have written down everything there is to know. The fact is, you are not now asking a scientific question. When you start asking about the reliability of memory, or the nature of law-like behavior, when you start asking questions about the extent of science and how much can be known, you are not asking scientific questions. Hmm. Well, then what are you doing? When you get to that high level of abstraction, some people say, well, what you're doing is wasting time. <laughs> and uh, if I get to the end of my prepared notes this evening, we're going to see that the sad thing is, at the end of the 20th century, in many ways, philosophy has come around to saying it's really a waste of time, too. If there is a pragmatic value to what you're doing, and you ought to be doing it. It's a waste of time. Actually, what you're doing, though, is not wasting time. You're doing philosophy. Wow. So philosophy is that level of intellectual inquiry that goes beyond here on the discipline of science to asking more fundamental questions about the nature of reality, how we know what we know, and how we should live. I said a few moments ago the reason why many philosophy instructors lose their audience is because I think students come in to study philosophy, and they're not at that level of abstraction. They are not interested in that sort of thing, and they just lose out altogether. Because if you come in expecting this to operate like some type of science, like what's the area we're going to study in human experience now? What am I going to, how can I do it? How am I going to get ahead in life? How am I going to make a better living doing this? You're not going to be satisfied. Now, maybe some people shouldn't take courses in philosophy because they cannot be motivated to get to the place where they ask the really tough, basic, fundamental questions. But until you're interested in doing that, a philosophy class is going to be extremely boring to you. Topical questions typically exhibit the following characteristics. One, a question that is philosophical in nature doesn't fall within the competence of any particular science. That is to say, when we're asking a philosophical question, there's no special science we can go to for our answer. We can't go to medicine, we can't go to astronomy, we can't go to agriculture, we can't go to political science, whatever it may be, and get an answer to our question. Philosophical questions are not like that, because they don't deal with just one delineated aspect of human experience. They deal with what is logically fundamental to all human experience and thinking. Philosophy is very broad, and for that reason doesn't fall into one of the pigeonholes of a science, be it the science of grammar or of physical education. Secondly, a philosophical question, it's the sort of 
question that has very persuasives and cons that are available in answering it. Alternative answers can be made to appear very reasonable, very commonsensical. There are some things in the study of biology that just don't fit. You say, well, that's absurd. You don't even have to take that into account. And this is both a blessing and a curse for the field of philosophy. When it comes to philosophy, all sorts of weird answers seem like they might be right. Even conflicting ones. And that makes it very difficult. That's because I think of the high level of abstraction at which we are working. Thirdly, in a philosophical question that's not immediately obvious to us, how to resolve the conflict between different schools of thought or different answers to the problem. Okay, let's take a philosophical question. A philosophical question would be like this. Is human behavior completely predictable and law-like, or is there some sense in which human behavior is human self-determined, and therefore unpredictable? Now, when you stop and think about it, there are good reasons to answer yes or no to that question. And after we've heard the reason why it seems like human behavior is predictable, I mean, everyone knows to some degree it's predictable, or you wouldn't be able to live in the same house with any individual, or in the same block. There would be no political science. There would be no society if human behavior was not somewhat predictable. But on the other hand, if human behavior were totally predictable, then we wouldn't have all the things that are so interesting in life. We wouldn't have creativity and freedom, and also mental disturbances and crime and all sorts of other things. And so it seems like you can make a pretty good case for human behavior not being predictable. And here's the interesting thing. Once you've heard the case, pro and con, about human freedom, or whether human behavior is totally predictable, when you say, well, now how are we going to resolve this? How are we going to decide between these two points of view? It's just in philosophical questions that people tend to go, I don't know, what do we do now? Where do we go to answer this sort of thing? There's a sense of mystery about doing philosophy, because it's not just a matter of getting hold of the good earth and seeing how to plant better corn. How do we resolve conflicting theories about planting corn? Well, you go out there and you try the different things and you test it and you find out who gets the better corn. It isn't that way with philosophy. You can't get your hands on it. You can't even, in many cases, decide how we are going to argue through to a conclusion on a philosophical question. Philosophical questions deal with fundamental issues about reality, about knowledge, and about human behavior. Questions which are systematically basic to everything that we do and everything that we say. When you answer a philosophical question, you're not just dealing with a delineated aspect of human experience. You're saying something about all human experience and all human reasoning. Philosophy goes beyond specialized or narrow science and deals with questions that are conceptual and abstract in nature. That is to say, these questions have depth, they have generality about them. Philosophers look for explanations, but not explanations for how corn grows or how to get a rocket to the moon or even how to write a poem. Philosophers look for explanations that explain the world in which we live in terms of its basic reality, how we know what we know about it, and how we should live in it. Philosophers look for ultimate principles of explanation. And those principles of explanation need to be organized. They can't be haphazard and ad hoc. They need to be explicatable. That is to say, they have to be something you can state and talk about. It isn't any good to say, well, I've got my philosophy, but I can't tell you what it is. You've got to be able to explicate what those principles are, and those principles need to be justifiable. It's not just a matter of what kind of hat do you want to wear today, or what makes you feel good. There's a justification for the principles that we use, and they must be organized and statable. Now, if you've been following, and if you haven't, shame on you, but if you've been following, you might now be saying, well, that means philosophy sounds very much like religion. Because religion deals with ultimate concern and how to explain the world in which we live and how we know what we know and how we should live. 
religion goes beyond the competence of science. And the answer to a religious problem affects all areas of a person's life. And I would say you're right. That in a certain sense, the philosophical quest is just the religious quest. And the difference between Christians and non-Christians can be called a religious difference or a philosophical difference. And the reason why we talk in religious terminology sometimes, we talk in philosophical terminology other times, is because we're dealing with different audiences. The real basic difference between the philosophical quest and the religious quest is that philosophers talk a language that's common to a lot of different kinds of religious attitudes, and religions usually talk a language that's common to that religion. Christians have their ghetto language. Muslims have their ghetto language. Baha'i has its ghetto language and so forth. And philosophers use a language as well that kind of talks about what all of those things are interested in and it does with the more standardized vocabulary. So this is what philosophers are all about. I'm going to try to explain now what the task of philosophy is rather than just what it is that philosophy itself might be. Our second basic question then, what act of philosophy? And the answer to our question is twofold. There are two things philosophers try to do. And I'm going to start drawing pictures now so you can wake up. Now it's going to get fun. Let's think of the different departments in a university or the different areas for human study and reflection as being like pillars or walls or part of the structure of a house. So I'm going to draw one pillar here for what's called a geography, and then another pillar here for grammar, and another pillar here for biology, and another pillar for psychology, and then on and on and on. Or if I add a few more, you can fill in the illustration yourself. Now, if these are pillars in a building, who's going to be really bold here and tell me what's missing from this building? Anybody? There's no foundation on this building. Right. Now, who gives us the presuppositions that are used in geography, grammar, biology, psychology, and on and on and on? Yeah, you're young and sleeping, so you know the answer. Who do you think is going to give the foundation to all of those different sciences? Well, if you call it theology, I will not object, but tonight we're using the more broad terminology, which is philosophy. Exactly. Philosophy aims to lay a reliable foundation for all of the sciences by explaining what is real, how we know what we know, and how we should live. Philosophy, first of all, has a critical task, then, in examining various presuppositions, cross-examining them, and determining which are reliable. You think of Socrates for a moment here. Socrates went about Athens making a nuisance of himself, by asking people questions like, what is justice? And the Athenians all thought they knew what justice was. Me, I'm a little slow. What is justice? And then those that would engage him in dialogue would say, well, justice is this. And then Socrates would begin to ask questions. Well, but if it's that, then how about this situation? Or are you meaning to say this? And then the person who knew so clearly and certainly what justice was would start getting frustrated. You probably had that experience, if you haven't talked to me sometime. That's what we say. Why? Well, what about this? And how about that? You see, the philosopher starts becoming critical, or if you will, analytical. He starts analyzing what you're saying, breaking it down, wondering if this really is adequate, care up to its logical conclusions, Wondering why you're saying that, if you have a good reason, or if this is just arbitrary, 
the philosopher you see as being analytical or critical in order that he might find the answer to such questions as what is knowledge, what is justice, what is beauty, and so forth. So the philosopher's first job is the critical job of laying a foundation for all of the science. Because once you know what the nature of reality is, or what human nature is, and how we know what we know, and whether memory is reliable, and how we should live our lives, and whether truth is important, and so forth and so on, that's not going to affect simply geography. It's also going to affect jurisprudence. It's also going to affect the way you write literature. It's going to affect biology and astronomy and all the rest. And so the philosopher lays a foundation as questions and cross-examining ideas. The philosopher lays a foundation for all of the other sciences. And that's why it's so important that we do philosophy. It's one of the reasons why the university is in such sad shape today is because people don't know how to do philosophy. And people carry into their various departments conflicting presuppositions about their field of study, and they don't even know. Let me give you an illustration of this. Let's say that you're a university student, and you sign up for a psychology class. And you go all semester studying psychology, and without being told this, it turns out that your professor is a behaviorist. Being a behaviorist, your professor believes that all human behavior is predictable and subject to law-like explanation. That there is no human freedom. That everything we do is a result of certain conditioning mechanisms that are part of our experience in this world. And consequently, the kind of person you are and what you do is, in a sense, dependent upon your environment, your context, your conditioning. You are, uh, this doesn't sound very glorious, I know, but to put it very bluntly, you are something of an advanced white rat. And then, having taken your morning class in psychology, you go get lunch at the student union and get your new set of books and so forth and go on over for your afternoon class in political science. In which class, the political scientist is explaining to us why the government of the United States is oppressive and people are being taken advantage of, and why we need to engage in revolution to overcome the tyrannical order in which we live. You understand? This person who is teaching you has assumed something about human nature as well. And this person has assumed voices, and that you are free, to at least a significant degree, to change the world in which you live. That world which, according to the morning lecture, was actually controlling the kind of person you are. But you see, if your professors don't stand up and say, now, here are the presuppositions under which I am working, or on which I am working, watch those metaphors, these are my presuppositions, and by the way, there's some guy that was lecturing this morning who is really out to lunch and doesn't know what he's talking about. I completely disagree with him. If you don't have that red flag for you, then you just go through university and you pick up this course and that course and so forth, and you end up and you graduate, and you don't know what it's all about. Because you've never bothered to sort it out, to become analytical and critical, asking what are the presuppositions about these fundamental issues that we should use. The philosopher does that. And aren't you glad we have philosophy? The second thing philosophers do, what else is missing in my illustration? This is going to be a good building. If we have a foundation, the critical task has been laid with reliable presuppositions that are used in all these areas. And we've developed our geography and our psychology and our political science and our biology and astronomy and all the rest. We've got all of these pillars or walls here. What are we missing? Someone. A roof, a treasure, that's what dogs say. That's what we're missing. There's no roof. Now, what department attempts to bring all of these various things together into a coherent whole to explain to us what the whole picture of reality in human life is? Who is going to put a roof over the house of knowledge? 
The conservative philosophy is to provide just that kind of organization in unity between the various fields of knowledge. Philosophy aims not for just a piecemeal understanding of this or that part of human experience or life or reality, but the philosopher is looking for what we might call the total picture. When you put it all together, when you've heard the political scientist and you've heard the astronomer and you've heard the biologist and you've heard the people who write wonderful literature and you've listened to all the concerts, what do you say about it all? How do you put it all together? The philosopher tries to find a constructive total picture for human experience in life. That is to say, the philosopher aims to develop an adequate worldview. A worldview is a set of presuppositions about reality and how we should live our lives that is not verified by the methods of natural science. These presuppositions haven't been proven by the chemist and the biologist around us. They aren't verified in that way at all. We're dealing with a set of presuppositions, a set of fundamental, basic ideas that have not been verified by the methods of natural science, but in terms of which every aspect of man's knowledge and every aspect of man's experience are interpreted and interrelated. Wow. Let me say that again for those of you taking notes. A worldview is a network of presuppositions about reality, knowledge, and behavior that are not verified by the methods of natural science, but in terms of which, that is, terms of this roof, this constructive total picture, in terms of which every aspect of man's knowledge and experience are interpreted and interrelated. That is, the philosopher can look at what the political scientist is saying and the philosopher can look at what the psychologist is saying and relate them to each other in terms of a total view of reality. The philosopher's aim is to be able to have such a picture that every aspect of human experience finds its proper place. And in terms of that worldview that is sought by the philosopher, man then can understand what he is what his place in the world is, what his task is, where he is going, and how he should live. I bet you know some people that would like answers to the questions. What is man? Is he nothing more used out of the primordial slime of evolution? And if so, then why should we afford him any dignity? Why should we care about not running him over when he's in the street, and it would cause us a 10-second delay getting to where we want to go. Why shouldn't we just run him over? It's a dog-eat-dog world, right? Survival of the fittest. What is man? And it's not just for the sake of answering ethical questions. I bet you know some people that get pretty confused and down in the mouth because they don't know what they are all about either. Who am I? What is it to live? Or in some cases, what is it to die? If I could figure out what death was all about, then maybe I'd understand what life was all about. But unfortunately, I will not experience death until I die, and then it will be too late, because I won't be living anymore. People get all messed up because they don't know where to put human nature, how to understand it, or what the nature of reality is. Where's the world going? Where am I going? Should I be going there? Do I want to go there? How shall I get there? Those are philosophical questions. And even though we have to talk in abstract terms, and I know it's difficult to keep attention when we're not throwing a lot of facts and figures on the board or watching flashy things like concerts and basketball games and so forth, philosophers do a very important thing when they show us what the overall picture is, in terms of which every element of man's experience can be interpreted. Ah, but I said everyone does philosophy. You don't have to go to the university to take a course in philosophy. You don't even have to pick up a textbook of philosophy. In some cases, you might do better if you don't. Everybody 
everyone sitting in this room, and everybody that you're related to and that you've ever known, everybody asks those questions. Are quasars real? Is magnetism real? Are angels real? Is God real? Is love real? Am I under obligation not to lie to my neighbor? Is it my obligation to avoid sexual immorality? Am I under obligation to be honest in my research as a scientist? Or if I could win the Nobel Prize, would it be all right for me to falsify data? Your neighbors probably wonder about that one a lot. What should I do when someone crosses me? What should I do when a promise has been broken? We ask these questions and we come up with answers. And I know a lot of the very common answers. I know many of what you might call the low-level answers about what is real. I'll tell you what is real, which you can touch. That's real. All right. You have to ask your neighbor, have you ever touched love? You know, and your neighbor's going to go one of two ways. You're either going to say, I'm tired of this conversation, <laughs> or he's going to say, no, love isn't real. They say, is that the way you live? You come home from work, you don't kiss your wife? You don't buy Christmas presents for your children? You don't care about people that are hurting? Love isn't real? Okay, love is real. Well, how about the philosophy that says, only that is real? You ever stubbed your toe on love? Sounds like a country and western hit, doesn't it? <laughs> I was looking for love in all the wrong places and I stubbed my toe. <laughs> and it, what was I say? Anyway, we know some of the low level answers that are given to these questions. And all I want to point out for you is that the answers we're talking about here are philosophical in nature. They may not be dignified with the term philosophy. When you talk to yourself in reflection or talk to your neighbor about such, it may not be the case that you say, well, here's a philosophical issue, and I think I'll be philosophical today. It doesn't happen that way. We worry about how we should live and what life is all about, how we should treat people, and whether certain things that we might be afraid of are real or not, when we start wondering about those things, we're doing philosophy. And everyone does it. But now, back to the first point, not everyone does it well. To do philosophy well means that you are going to be self-conscious about doing philosophy. Instead of just picking up on this, you only go around once in life, live for all the gusto you can get and not even knowing you're doing philosophy, you're going to stop and say, no, wait a minute, what do I know for sure? What is real? What can I count on? How should I live my life? What is man? What is the world? Is life nothing but a dream? Is it a tale told by an idiot, full of fury, signifying nothing? You have to start asking those questions self-consciously and then forcing yourself Secondly, to become consistent in the way you answer them. And then ask, what basis do I have for any of the answers that I'm offering? In Colossians, the second chapter, Paul says that in Christ are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We're kind of going to the back of the book now and looking at the answers that have been provided. The Apostle Paul, on the authority of God himself, speaks with inspired authority and tells us that all of those philosophical questions that are most important to us will be answered in terms of the revelation of Jesus Christ himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Verses, if you still have your finger there in Colossians chapter 2, You'll notice that Paul says, and beware of vain philosophy. Beware of vain philosophy, which has been used by some fundamentalists and pietists to show that we should never do philosophy. Don't ever take a course in philosophy. Beware of vain philosophy. Of course, what does Paul actually say? Beware of vain philosophy, which is deceitful, which is after the traditions of men, 
and the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. That is, Paul says, you need to do philosophy so you can beware of the wrong kind of philosophy, that which is not after Christ, that which is vain and deceitful philosophy. You all know the story of the doctor to be who went to medical school, and he decided that he wasn't going to specialize in disease and broken bones, and that he was really interested in health. And so instead of studying diseases and how the human body gets broken and bruised and cut and so forth, he would only study healthy bodies. Because after all, that's what he was interested in, health. Being interested in health, he wasn't going to study all the negative stuff. Now, would this be a very good doctor? Would you like to go to a doctor's? Well, I don't know the difference between malaria and a broken leg, to tell you the truth. But I do know what a healthy body looks like, and that's what I'm going to help you get. <laughs> no, when Paul says beware of false philosophy, beware of vain philosophy, he's requiring you to study it so you can see it and identify it and avoid it and defeat it. That is not a challenge to avoid philosophy altogether. It is rather a requirement to study that philosophy which is inappropriate and that philosophy which is appropriate, so you know the difference between the two. So you know the difference between health and sickness. Some people don't reason in a healthy way. And they've gotten themselves individually and corporately, socially, into a whole lot of trouble. Or to put it in Christian terms now, to get out of the language of the philosophy, we have a lot of people who are thinking sinfully. They are not submitting to the revelation of God himself, but rather trying to become a law to themselves. They are becoming autonomous, thinking they can figure out what life is all about and the nature of reality and how we know what we know on the basis of something other than God's speaking in Christ. And these people are lost spiritually. And being lost spiritually, they are destroying their world and they are unhappy in their individual lives. They are lost and spiritually dead. The Christian philosopher is that philosopher which shuns autonomy, trying to be a law to himself, doing it on his own, and submits humbly to the revelation of God. For the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, according to the book of Proverbs, is the fear of the Lord. Living in the holy presence of God and humbly submitting to his word is the beginning of knowledge. And one of the things we as Christian philosophers want to do then is to challenge people in all areas of life, whether it's geography or psychology or political science, that if they do not begin with Christ, they will end with destruction. That, that sounds like a biblical message, doesn't it? That is the story of the Bible. If you reject the source of your being, if you reject the one who directs your life and gives you assurance for what you know and for who you are, you will end up destroying yourself. This is why philosophy is so important. Because philosophy pertains to every area of life. Philosophy gives us a worldview in terms of which we can understand human existence. And if you don't have the right philosophy, the right worldview, what you will have instead is misery now and eternal destruction later. And that's why I have given a good portion of my life to the study of philosophy. It's not because it just, in some sense, is really interesting to me. I think the fundamental issues are right there in philosophy. And if you're going to meet the world where it is, you're going to have to speak in philosophical terms. You can't just use the ghetto language of the church. You can't just talk theology, although I'll be very honest with you, when Jan answered earlier, theology instead of philosophy, they are for me, in a sense, interchangeable. The way the Christian does philosophy is very close to the way the Christian theologian does his job. We go to the revelation of God and try to understand it, and then go out into the world and try to apply it. Now, after we take a, a short break, when we come back, I'm going to try to suggest to you certain standard problems in the history of philosophy to keep recurring and suggest that only the Christian is able to resolve the tensions that are in that area 
And then I would like finally this evening to look at the term in modern philosophy from the time of Kant, and especially in the 20th century, to the world's confession, really, that it cannot come up with an adequate worldview. And what the world does then is it starts saying, no one needs a worldview. Who cares about worldview? And so what you have are the anti-philosophies of the 20th century. And it's at that point that I hope you will, I'm, I'm kind of giving you it ahead of the punchline ahead of time, because some of you may be leaving, I know. Because at that point, we can understand, I think, really, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For you see, the world and its wisdom rejects the cross of Christ and its social ways, its opportunity and its ability to do philosophy. Well, I'll come back for more after the break, please. Okay. The question is, does the world at large listen to me or write me off as not a real philosopher? The philosophical world. Okay. You're talking about me individually or Christians as a whole? I know the world does not write off Christian philosophers as a whole, although there's no doubt at all that there's a great prejudice against them. They have a very difficult time gaining respect. But many philosophers that are committed to Jesus Christ have made quite a name for themselves, even in the 20th century. I don't altogether agree with them, and so I mean, I hesitate to mention them, but if you were to list the top five philosophers in America today, I think just about anybody would include Alvin Plantica, who was in the Christian Reformed Church, as a matter of fact. And so Christian philosophers are not automatically dismissed, and more and more people are seeing even some well-known secular philosophers be converted and so forth, becoming Roman Catholics in some cases, and in many cases not believing Reformed doctrine and all that. But so that happens. In my own personal experience, there was a prejudice against me in graduate school because I was a seminary graduate until after the first semester of work. And I did good enough work that at that point, then I was sought out, and a lot of people, students and professors as well, wanted to know more about Christian philosophy and so forth. And I think this is not just in philosophy, though, and I don't think this has to do with me, so don't take this wrong. I think Christians, when they go on to graduate school, must do competent and good work. They must do respectable work. They must win the attention of their professors. And it's by outdoing what the world does, rather than coming in and just with the blasting them and saying, well, yeah, what do you know? I've got a Bible here. That doesn't convince people. And that's true in history, and it's true in literature, and it's true in philosophy. The philosophical world is, because it's not getting very far on its own, is willing to hear just about anything that's out there. But the prejudice. You know, the natural man receives not things of the Spirit of God, but they are spiritually discerned. And so when you start talking about things, whether it's in Christian <laughs> jargon or not, to talk about religious matters, there is an automatic prejudice. But you can shut the mouth of the unbeliever. That's possible. But have you seen, like, let's say you're doing a lecture? Yes, if you're asking whether you can see, when you lecture in a secular environment, if you can see it on the faces of people, it's kind of like the coin drops, the light shines, let me guess. Absolutely. And I realize that philosophers are not per se evangelists, but the evangelistic task is performed by the philosopher, the good Christian. I'm not in favor of schools that don't teach from an explicitly Christian point of view, and so I'm not trying to encourage anyone to go out in terms of missionary endeavor to do this. But I do know that those who are Christians that have the opportunity to lecture to such people or those who are professors that are Christians are able to lead people subtly to the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they are not preaching John 3.16. In my own experience in a Christian high school, now if it's a Christian high school, you might not think this would happen, but it so happened where the Lord placed this school. We had a number of Muslim uh, families that wanted to make use of our private education. They had to s submit to the covenant of the school that they would not, you know, disagree with that and so forth. They just have to put up with the Bible classes and so forth and so on. But I've seen a good number of those people come from Hindu and Muslim homes and Chinese homes, were a Buddhist and so forth, who through the study of my philosophy class have realized that they needed Christianity. So yes, it does happen. This side. Good. 
from a Christian perspective, I agree that we shouldn't be caught up in jargon that people on the outside wouldn't be able to understand, but I would venture to say that a good, what you call a good philosopher, I think we have to be careful how we define a good philosopher, and I would venture to say that a truly good philosopher is one who is Christian and who really keeps after truth, which is found in the Bible. Would you disagree with that? And I think that you have to be careful with when you say good philosopher, that some other people might misunderstand, might think that a non-Christian could be a good option, God, not as a good philosopher. Okay, well, let me rephrase the question. I guess you're asking whether unbelievers can be good philosophers. I certainly agree with you that a good philosopher is one who's going to be seeking the truth as it's found in Jesus Christ and applying it to all areas of life. That is what a good philosopher would do. But you have to understand that the word good is used in different ways. Here we're using in the evaluative sense of a philosopher who is telling the truth and is helpful and healthy and that sort of thing. Good, however, can also be used in the sense not so much of ethical evaluation, but in the sense of efficiency or skill. In that sense, we could speak of a good hitman. <laughs> not because it's good to be a hitman, to be an assassin, but because there are some people that are very talented and do the job well. Okay? So, now, there are some people that are technically proficient, say, at logic, or discussing the issues of metaphysics, the nature of reality, and the nature of knowledge, and so forth. They have technical skills that would make them good philosophers, but only in that sense of the details, the technicalities, not in the evaluative sense that they are arriving at the truth in a healthy way. I think it's dangerous to you to in that way, you could worry on being deceptive that, that I think that's a world view that, that some, based on the world standards rather than Christian standards that... Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think that my answer is based on a non-Christian world view. I think my answer is just based on an analysis of ordinary English language. The English language allows for that ambiguity, unfortunately. We do speak of a good knife and a good carburetor, and by that we don't mean their behavior is commendable. It obeys the laws of God. A good knife and a good carburetor turns out to be those which are technically proficient, cuts well, regulates the fuel intake of the car in a proper way, and so forth. And similarly, we can speak of someone being a good scholar in that he's mastered the skills of that particular field, even though he's not arriving at the truth. A good politician, same ambiguity. Do you mean by that the politician is coming to the right, is voting in the right way, or do you mean a man who's good at the technique of winning votes and that sort of thing? All I'm saying is, I'm answering about the English language, not about a worldview as to what is good or bad. I do think there are philosophers that are technically proficient. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and hit the bell notification. This recording has been released into the public domain by the Bonson Institute. Duplication, sharing, and distribution is encouraged. For more information about the life and ministry of Dr. Greg L. Bonson, visit our website, bonsoninstitute.com, where we aim to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ.